I'm Gord Long with the Financial Repression Authority. I have Doug Casey joining us today from Tucson, Arizona. Doug needs, I think, little introduction as an author, investor, and amongst many other things, the founder and chairman of Casey Research. Welcome back, Doug. Uh, thanks, Gord. It's always a pleasure. Well, the last time I talked to you, you were on, I think you were on your horse, but you were certainly in Argentina. Uh, when we called. So I assume this is just a pleasure visit or maybe a business trip back to the States? Well, I live in Aspen, Colorado during the northern summer. Uh, and I'm here in Tucson because we had Casey Research had its annual summit. So I'm just hanging around on my way to New Orleans for Brian London's uh, annual New Orleans festivities and then off to uh, Argentina and Uruguay again. Doug, uh, I want to talk about uh, retiring, working over, overseas, offshore, and your observations on that. But before we jump into that, can you, could you share your observations of what you're seeing when, every time you come back to America? Changes or an, an attitude? or Are there any really noticeable changes that you're seeing that we as Americans may not notice on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, that's a very good point. Um, look, in terms of convenience, you can't beat uh, the United States. <clears throat> the, uh, you know, the amount and quality of restaurants and drugstores on every corner and coffee shops and home delivery with things like Amazon and the way the telephones work and you know, it's a, it's a wonderful consumer society. Uh, so from that point of view, it kind of puts people to sleep. It's like, uh, you know, being in a, a, a really uh, lush and comfortable and well-maintained prison. <laughs> That's a good analogy. I like that one. <laughs> but all the while, uh, you've got a cancer growing in the country. And uh, it's very scary. You notice this when you come into the U.S. and you see the armed border patrol agents asking you questions, uh, the, the immigration people. And even when you leave the U.S., there could be black jump th jumpsuited thugs in the, uh, in the uh, uh, jetway as you get on your plane asking you questions about whether you're taking money outside of the country. Uh, so, no, the, the country is gradually deteriorating, and most Americans are actually in the position of that famous frog that uh, is boiled to death very, very gradually as the temperature of the pot he's cooking in gets raised. So I'm very pleased uh, to uh, come back to the U.S. for a few months every year, but uh, I'm much more happy living outside of the States. And I, I've lived in, I guess I've lived in 10 different countries at this point. So uh, from my point of view, it's kind of like see one, you see them all. Uh, I used, back to our, the subject we want to talk about, about living abroad, working abroad, retiring abroad. Are, are you seeing trends that way visibly to you in your travels? Well, the standard of living in most foreign countries is going up tremendously. Um, look, within my lifetime, uh, let's say 50 years ago, uh, the United States was absolutely on the top of the heap. It, uh, the standard of living in this country was, was way, way above anything else. If you talked about the Orient, I mean, what you're talking about you know, poor people still having to walk in the in back of their water buffalo in the fields. And, you know, the Europeans couldn't afford cars, you know, and there was no comparison between any other country in the world and the U.S., with the, with the exceptions of Canada and Australia and New Zealand, perhaps. But now, uh, in terms of general standard of living, as nice as the U.S. is from a consumer's point of view, I'd say it's probably about 10 or 15 in terms of the average standard of living. In other words, we're exceeded by 10 or 15 other countries and we're falling further. 
We, we've noticed, uh, in, in to support that, Doug, uh, people retiring, whether through Thailand, various areas in Malaysia, Indonesia, what I call the cultural crescent, uh, the standard of living is so high and the health care and what's available, but what they pay a thousand dollars a month is seven or eight thousand dollars a month here in the United States. And they, they, these gaps can't sustain themselves. And I say that can't because I've got to believe people are going to begin to want to retire, are going to be forced to retire in some of these places. Am I off track in that thinking? Oh, you're absolutely right. And I have friends from Europe and from the Orient that when they come to the U.S., and incidentally, they don't like to come to the U.S. anymore. Uh, it's no longer a, a, a pleasure to come here. They, they feel like they're, they're going to a third world country. And in most cases, they can't wait to get back on the plane to uh, get to places where people uh, have a higher standard of living and know how to live. So, uh, and this trend is going to continue. That's what the $19 trillion of acknowledged government debt is all about. Uh, as it's paid off, see, the reason we have, we've had such a high standard of living over the last few decades is we've been borrowing against the future. That's what all this debt is about. When you take on debt, uh, you're either mortgaging your future or you're consuming capital that somebody else has saved in the past and they've lent to you to increase your standard of living now. But when you pay the debt back, uh, you reduce your standard of living by more than that amount because you have to pay interest on it in addition. And, and it's not as bad as it's going to get because interest rates now are at all-time historic lows. And uh, when, when they just rise to the mean again, uh, it, it's just going to be really ugly. Taxes are going up, inflation is going up, the standard of living is going down in the U.S. So an intelligent person will diversify if he possibly can, diversify politically, geographically at this point, while it's still possible. Well, it's still, well, it's still possible. That's a, a really good point because we're noticing with things such as FATCA, PFIC, uh, without getting into what these acronyms means, they're really new forms of stealth capital controls. Fallout that you're seeing in your, in your travels with these restrictions on moving capital out of the United States? That's very disturbing. Uh, your money is not your own, uh, actually, anymore. Uh, the U.S. government wants to know where you have everything in the world. Uh, your possessions are really the indirect possessions of the U.S. government. It's uh, very, very disturbing. And the current uh, impetus is towards taking cash which is to say dollar bills, hundred dollar bills, cash, paper, currency, uh, out of circulation so that everything that you do will go through your credit card or your smartphone uh, through the bank, uh, which means that you can't buy or sell anything without the state knowing it, what you're doing. Uh, this is a very disturbing uh, trend. Uh, it's one reason, another reason, there are other, many reasons, why people ought to uh, build a substantial uh, stash of gold and silver coins. Is that why we're seeing so few big currency denominated bills, as you mentioned, the $100 bill, even $50 bills, to actually force people to use uh, credit cards, other means, is, is in regards to what I'll refer to as the war on cash, which could be a, a proxy here to, to begin to put in negative interest rates in the future? Uh, no question about it. It's a, it's a very disturbing trend. So the only way you can beat that is by establishing a foreign bank or brokerage account, something that everybody should do, although now it's very hard to do. If, if an American goes abroad and wants to open up a bank or brokerage account, uh, chances are he won't be allowed to do it by the foreign institution. They don't want Americans' business. It's more trouble more danger than it's worth. So I suggest that you uh, try to uh, accumulate as many gold and silver coins in your own possession as possible. I think they're gonna turn out to be an excellent speculation, uh, a great way to conserve uh, your capital and uh, a way of avoiding uh, what the government is doing about uh, eliminating uh, cash in society. It's
it's, it seems to be clearly a strategy uh, that's being thought out and being implemented in most of the developed world. Am I overstepping my thoughts there? No, it's happening all over the world, actually. Uh, and other countries are further ahead of the U.S. I mean, the real problem here is the institution of government itself. Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't think that in today's high-tech world, uh, government serves a useful purpose. Uh, there's nothing that the state does that could not and would not be done better and cheaper and without um, coercion by the free market. So uh, I don't support uh, the U.S. government or any other government. Uh, they're anachronisms at best, and uh, they're actually you know, destructive anachronisms. Uh, they just they attract the worst kind of people, people that like to control other people. So that, that's my feeling about politics and government in general. But we seem to be moving towards, at least in the United States, maybe the developed countries, more and more centralized control, which is the absolute ob opposite of what made us successful. That is the individual and, and, and moving the decision making to the lowest levels. And where I'm going on that comment, I spent many years in corporations. And 25 years ago, it was about distributing decision making, flattening organizations, and the technology allowing us to do that. And today, it's like governments are, are pulling it up instead of reversing it. And it's almost, again, like taxation should be starting at the low level and passing it up to the federal government as opposed to the federal government passing it down and decision making now because we have the technology. So it's just, it seems the government's going the different direction to society in general. Uh, just an observation. Well, you know, the average person is, has the psychology of a whipped dog. Uh, he does, <laughs> and he thinks that the government actually has a right <clears throat> to tell him what to do and how to do it. Uh, I don't believe in that. I think that uh, to start with, it's your duty as a patriotic citizen to deny revenue to the state wherever possible, because the state is like a, a predator, and it considers you as a milk cow at best. And uh, uh, if, it need, if need be, it'll treat you as a beef cow. So people have to uh, get this idea out of their mind that uh, the government is their friend. It's we the people, a ridiculous concept. And Congress isn't full of people that look like Jimmy Stewart uh, that are trying to do the right thing. I mean, uh, the Congress and people in the government generally are America's only native criminal class. So... Uh, people have to overturn their thinking uh, as quickly as possible, in my view. Living in, in Argentina, which is a country that has truly suffered true financial repression for or had for a protracted period of time. And I notice when I talk to people in Buenos Aires that their whole attitude towards store of value, protecting their investments, lack of trust in what governments would do with bonds is, is so blatant. Is that a fair observation that, you've seen, in that you've seen in Argentina? Yes, it absolutely is. The average middle class and above Argentine uh, hates the government, uh, does everything he can to, uh, to uh, deny it tax revenue, to disobey its regulations. That's why I like Argentina. The government down there is, <laughs> is actually criminally insane. Uh, that's the bad news. The good news is that um, people in the government are very overt uh, about theft. In other words, that's why they're in the government. And uh, they generally leave you alone. In other words, if you're a foreigner, you're a welcome guest because you can come and go as you please. They don't consider you as... Uh, if you're a citizen of a country, the government considers you its property. Uh, this is why uh, you're better off living in a country where you're not a citizen. Uh, they treat you as a, a guest that has to be cultivated as opposed to... Uh, as I said before, a milk cow that has to be milked. Uh, so I really enjoy Argentina. Um, I feel much freer there in many, many ways than I do in the U.S., uh, despite the fact that the government is, is even more uh, degraded than that in the U.S. But, you know, we can watch Argentina. Uh, we're only, uh, in the U.S., we're only about 20 years behind them in terms of 
uh, how bad the government is, is, is getting. Yeah, I, I've actually heard that said. And I, actually, people have told me it's about 12 years is their assessment. So it like it's they definitely have led and, and, and there's a lot to be learned. Uh, from Argentinians and how they invest in their 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 in that, in that well, regard. see what happens in Argentina, just as in the U.S., is the government attempts to bribe the lower classes. It throws them, you know, a few breadcrumbs and so forth, and they feel eternally grateful for that. And it's very much that way in Argentina, and certainly it's that way in the U.S. Uh, as proof of that, I would offer that uh, Obama was elected eight years ago, and I said, okay, uh, you know, give the, you know, well-spoken, good-looking black guy a chance. Uh, but then when they re-elected him, it showed how degraded the electorate actually is. And the fact is, in the United States, almost half of the American populace receives more from the government than they pay into the government. Now, I don't believe you should pay anything to the government, because uh, it doesn't serve a useful purpose. But the fact that most people see the government as a cornucopia uh, is a sign that, uh, you know, th things are getting worse fast. I don't know who's going to win this coming election. I suppose if Hillary stays out of jail and runs, uh, she's going to win. But uh, on the other hand, by this time next year, we're going to be in the midst of a gigantic financial hurricane and... Uh, I think Trump is going to be the uh, candidate for the Republicans. And because he's an outsider and because he projects a lot of certainty, it could be that he'll win. And uh, I don't support a lot of the things that Donald says, but he'd be vastly better than anybody that the Democrats have put up. There's a tremendous movement, it seems, uh, and certainly my observations, of people renouncing their U.S. citizenship seems to be a growing trend. It's an ex can be an expensive proposition in, in some cases, but it's it's it, and they're moving moving offshore or trying to retire or move offshore. What 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 would you caution them about? What would what would you say they really need to think about uh, before they do that? Well, to start with, the reason why people are doing it is because once trends are in motion, they tend to stay in motion until a crisis stops them. And the trend towards collectivism, towards uh, all kinds of status in the U.S. has been accelerating for many years, and it's going to reach a crescendo. So uh, if you're prudent and if you have some wealth, uh, renouncing your citizenship is actually very prudent. Uh, a lot of – it scares – the concept scares a lot of people. But I point out that your U.S. passport is really uh, – it's nothing more than a, a driver's license on a uh, national basis. In other words, it's just government ID, and you shouldn't have any loyalty to your government ID. Uh, the only reason to keep a U.S. passport, frankly, uh, is a certain amount of convenience uh, because it offers a lot of visa-free travel around the world, more, more than most other countries. But uh, the U.S. is the only country in the world that attempts to tax you on all of your income, uh, no matter where you are in the world, even if you never come back to the U.S. And if you don't pay your taxes for a few years, you'd better not come back to the U.S. So I think that um, just as uh, all of our ancestors uh, left the place where they were in Europe or the Orient or wherever it might have been to come to the U.S. when it was the best place in the world to come to, it's incumbent upon freedom seekers to leave the U.S. and go to where they have more freedom and opportunity. So it's actually no big deal. There's a growing trend for dual citizenship and seeking out countries that uh, there's advantages, whether they move there or not, but holding uh, a duplicate citizenship or multiple citizenship. Any views on that? Yes, absolutely. Because if you look at your U.S. passport, you'll notice that it says... Uh, in, very clearly, this is this document is the property of the U.S. government, and it can be taken away from you or now canceled electronically uh, at the will of any bureaucrat uh, for any number of reasons, uh, justified or unjustified. So that um, if you value your personal freedom, uh, you're very wise to have a travel document from some other country in addition, even if you don't renounce your U.S. passport. 
uh, and citizenship. And uh, getting a second uh, citizenship um, or and passport uh, makes it much easier for you if the time comes when you want to renounce your citizenship to do so. Because you don't want to be left without a travel document. Uh, to me, it's uh, shameful uh, that people need travel documents. They need papers, uh, IDs to travel across these arbitrary borders. But that's the unfortunate world we live in at the moment. A little bit, bit of a mundane question for you, Doug, but I think a lot of our listeners have this view that health coverage when you're out traveling around the world is a real problem for them. You won't get the same quality that you have in the United States. Is that really a fair observation? No, it's not. First of all, I don't call it health coverage. I call it medical coverage. Uh, your health is something that you take care of yourself through proper uh, diet and exercise and prudent living habits. Uh, what you want is medical insurance in case you uh, need anesthesia or you need an operation. Um, point number one. Point number two, uh, the quality of medical care is at least as good yes. outside of the yes. U.S. as it is in the U.S., and it's much, much less expensive. So I personally don't have medical insurance uh, because if I needed a serious operation, uh, I'd have, I'd, I'd go to a hospital in Buenos Aires or for that matter in Bangkok and I'd have it performed uh, competently for, I'd say, 20% of what I'd pay in the U.S., maybe less. Yeah, well, I've lived and experienced the same thing. I've actually had operations when I was traveling around the world offshore, and uh, the cost was so staggeringly less, and the quality was absolutely there. there. In many cases, I would argue it could even be a little superior of the personal care that, that you're given. Maybe the staffing, there's more staffing for, because uh, it seems in hospitals and, and, and definitely in retirement homes today, they're just so understaffed because of lack of funding or against their, their costs. Whereas I don't see that when I'm abroad. I see they're still very rich in terms of the staffing capability and therefore the caring part of it. Uh, just in humble observations in my travel. Oh, I completely agree. And uh, I had an emergency appendectomy, happened to be in Buenos Aires a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, the hospital I went to, I had a uh, two-room suite. I had gourmet meals, exactly. not house hospital exactly. food. And uh, the whole thing, including a couple of days in the hospital, the opera, it was a couple thousand dollars. If that had been in the U.S., uh, 20000 30000 who knows? Precisely, precisely my observation. It's these false beliefs that may have been valid 20 years ago or more, uh, are not true today. They're not even close to being true. And I, I think they they may lock Americans into the choices that are still available to them. Uh, the average American has views like that of a medieval peasant where he's afraid, to, <laughs> he's afraid to go more than a day's walk for his village because he heard there might be dragons uh, over that. Uh, so. Yeah, I yeah, I pray it may be very true. Doug, we're up, we're, up, we're getting up against, sorry, you were going to say something? In fact, when I do recreational travel, uh, the places that are high on my list are always the places that the State Department has an advisory out about. Uh, because uh, then you can go to some place where the hotels are empty, and there are lots of taxis, the, the, the restaurants, you don't need a reservation, uh, costs are down. I mean, like I went to Israel during the last intifada, and there were like three other people at Masada. It was wonderful, instead of waiting in a four-hour line. So uh, don't listen to what your government tells you, and I, that or almost any other regard. Yeah, what happens in the you know, what happens in the media, and having traveled, I've seen this, is I'll pick on Thailand. Or there's a bit of social unrest in, 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 in Bangkok, down near the government buildings, and it's on the nightly news around the world. But for the vast majority of people living in Thailand, it's very peaceful. They don't even know what you're talking about because they hadn't read the newspaper. So it's just so. But in America, it's suddenly like, oh, you can't live there. It's too dangerous. But frankly, if you were to listen to the nightly news in America or anywhere out of the world, it's more dangerous here. And I live in the suburbs of Boston. I have my humble observations. But it's amazing how we get lulled culturally into false beliefs that can really not only restrict your options, but damage your future. 
as if things are changing. Totally. Along those, I, I would recommend a, a website that we publish. It's called uh, internationalman.com. Uh, we have a free blog every day that draws a lot of these things and a lot of interesting facts to people's attention that they might be totally unaware of otherwise. I, I highly recommend it to our listeners that Nick, we've had Nick on who writes there, who follows all the latest uh, kinds of developments with real hard hitting uh, journalism. It's a, it's, a, it's a number one source to go to. So Doug, we have to wrap now. Any final comments or uh, things you'd like to leave with our listeners? No, I just uh, encourage people to think as individuals, to think like a free man, not a serf, and to live long and prosper. Doug, thanks for your time. Thanks for your frank observations. And I hope our listeners are truly listen to what you said, because you're a man that's been around. You've been all around the world. You've been writing for at least 40 years. Uh, predicting a lot of the things that are now happening. I was reading books 30 years ago that you wrote that said this is what was in our store. So thank you for all your help. I appreciate that. Thanks. Talk to you again. Bye-bye.